the MoneyWeb Crypto Podcast, where we discuss all things crypto related. Your host, Kieran Ryan. Thousands of South Africans and many businesses have installed solar systems over the last few years to wean themselves off the ESCOM grid. What happens in the middle of a bright sunny day when the solar system generates surplus power? With no one to sell the surplus power, two megawatts of power across the country are going to waste. Well, what if you could use that power for Bitcoin mining? Africa, with its untapped potential, lack of transmission infrastructure and abundant, sustainable energy resources, holds the promise of being the next continent for significant growth in hash rate development. Exciting projects are already underway in this regard, and that's according to Jesse Pilka of a company called Hash Rate Up, which assists individuals and companies in making their first start into Bitcoin mining using otherwise stranded power. Jesse joins us now to discuss this. Welcome, Jesse. It's good to have you on for the first time on the MoneyWeb Crypto Podcast. And I guess it's a question a lot of South Africans might be asking, how can I use my surplus solar power to get into Bitcoin mining? And if so, where and how do I start? Hey, hey, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, where do you start? You start by checking out first and foremost how much surplus energy you actually have, right? So typically, as you've alluded to, solar power plants or, or solar installations are designed around the winter time, you know, when the solar irradiation is at its lowest. And then when, when the summer hits, um, that's when you get all the surplus and you typically have uh, batteries that are fully charged, you know, sun boiling down from the sky, and a lot of energy that could be produced but isn't because there's no offtake for it and setting to the grid in south africa is not very let's say developed right so that's what you start with you start by analyzing how much surplus power there actually is and then you make sure that you have gear installed at your house that enables you to um, smartly switch on and off devices right so there's devices out there that will, you know, um, that that your inverter at home fully automatically can be can be switching on. You can start manually if you have a readout of how much surplus power you have at any given moment, and that's that's how I think you should start. You know, analyze how much there is to to use, and then look into what type of miner is suitable for that load. All right. So, are we talking here about ordinary households? Are we talking about businesses? Do you have to have a certain amount of surplus power before you can start? In other words, what is the basic entry level to to get into Bitcoin mining using solar? Yeah, good question. It, it works the same at any scale, right? Whether you're doing ten megawatts or whether you're doing hundred watts, it doesn't matter, right? The the beautiful thing about Bitcoin miners is that they scale. Um, very flexibly. So you can run them at 100 watts, but you can also run them at 3.4 kilowatts where they consume as much as your toaster at home. And then you can add machines together, right? So you could buy three machines and have have a consumption of around 10 kilowatts. Um, if you're a business and you say, hey, I've, I've got large solar installations and I might have a surplus of, I don't know, a megawatt of solar power, then adjusting and according to how much is available, you can design your flexible Bitcoin mining load around that that number and the entry level cost starts <laughs> starts as high as you want it to be uh, and as low as you can get right so i'm not exactly sure on the cost to import mining machines i know of a few opportunities on, on gum trees and stuff like that where you can get your first asics but that's typically quite expensive um, there are shops in sa as well um, and uh, yeah it depends really on the on the mining machine that you get it's almost like you know you could get yourself the latest and greatest iphone that you want to use all the time so that you get your money back quickly um, or you use you know an old old android phone or whatever um, and you just use it for certain you know in certain instances and then it doesn't really matter um, if it's a little bit more expensive or not but importantly it's not a huge investment so then you're talking i don't know maybe two thousand three thousand five thousand rand right so it's important to notice here that you don't have to get the, the the latest and the best equipment you can get one of these old bitcoin miners that uh, I think you told me previously, we're selling for about $50, maybe 2,000 rand, something like that. And you can still mine effectively with that. Yes. I mean, it's very important. It absolutely makes no sense to get the latest and greatest gear because you're effectively entering a global competition. And there are miners out there that mine off of very cheap power 
um, in South America with the latest and greatest gear 24-7, 365. And you do not have that capability, right? You do not want to buy solar to mine Bitcoin because the kilowatt hour, including battery storage, is way too expensive. What you instead want to do is you want to buy a miner that you can use sometimes to fill the last pocket um, of load that you cannot otherwise use. So translating that into uptime means you have a very low uptime of running that miner. So you need to make sure that you keep your capital investment low. Right. So what about people who have installed solar on their roofs? Would it be worth their while to add a few more panels? I mean, solar panels are selling for maybe two and a half, three thousand rand each. So guy figures, well, I've, you know, I've got 10 panels. What if I add another 10? That might cost me 25, 30,000 rand. Would that be a feasible or an economical approach? Look, the fact of the matter is if you have solar installed, you will end up with overcapacity at one point or another in the year. So I would start with that, learn, see how it works, get familiar. And then after you've done that, you will be in a much more comfortable position to economically gauge whether it makes sense to add 10 more panels. I am against from the get-go saying, hey, I'm going to you know, design my house around this, um, this residential load that I have, but then I'm going to add 10 more panels to do Bitcoin mining simply because you have no idea whether you'll ever get the money back or not. Okay, tell us a bit about yourself and how you got started in this. Yeah, um, no problem. I'm a German national. Um, Hopefully that's not too audible. I live in Cape Town. I've moved here in September 22 with my wife, uh, two kids. Um, I got started in this working for a German company that sold solar power in West Africa and Mali. So we had around 20 off-grid sites. We sold power, we generated power, we distributed it as well. And we had one significant problem, which was, what do we do in our islanded grid of around 40 kilowatt peak? So we're talking 144 modules um, at around 400 uh, uh, kilowatt peak. I hope that math checks out. Um, Please don't go check. So we had that issue of what do we do on a weekend, on a Saturday morning, you know, when everybody's asleep, our batteries are fully charged and the, the, the sun in Mali is, um, yeah, giving us a lot of irradiation, which we could use to produce power, but there is literally nobody um, that could use it, right? And we have our buffer, that being the battery storage is fully charged already. So we end up having a bunch of stranded power, as it's often termed, um, that we cannot otherwise consume because we've got no grid to offload it to. Um, and that's where Bitcoin mining entered the fold as a potential off taker off at all times, basically. All right. So you transition from supplying solar power in Mali to using that surplus power to Bitcoin mining and relocated to South Africa to do that. No, I mean, in that, in that project, we didn't actually end up using it. It's just where, where, the, where the spark was created, basically. Um, I am very much into, into Bitcoin and all its, its, its facets. I studied energy economics, so I grasped the energy and the mining concept quite, quite quickly. Um, and now I run a hash right up. I run hash right up as a business, uh, being a consultant, um, being a broker in, in instances as well. I'm working a bunch with with miners in Africa to get more hash rate to the continent. We run a seed program as well, where where people, if they have access to to cheap energy, can apply to to receive their first refurbished ASICs um, below market prices to grow their operation um, to at some point become part of the Gamma uh, project, the Green Africa Mining Alliance. Um, so essentially, that's what my business does now. Yeah. You're right. And ASICs, just to be clear, that is the brand name for the Bitcoin mining rigs or a brand name. Yeah. I should clarify. ASIC stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. Uh, It's basically a computer that does one thing extremely efficiently. Um, That's what a Bitcoin mining machine is. All right. Bitcoin mining doesn't really need grid connection. This is an interesting thing about Bitcoin mining. So you could have a Bitcoin mine in a very isolated area with absolutely no connection to the grid. Uh, And this means this type of activity, this Bitcoin mining can happen theoretically anywhere. 
Yes, Bitcoin mining is the perfect consumer for any electricity generator. I'll tell you why. So the first thing you said was location, it being location agnostic. It doesn't matter where it runs as long as it has an internet connection. And importantly, that internet connection does not have to have a lot of throughput um, capability because the data that you transmit is um, yeah, very, very little. It also is time agnostic, right? So it works whenever you want it to, 365, 24, seven. There is no holiday in Bitcoin mining. Uh, blocks keep being produced every 10 minutes. And so um, it doesn't know any Christmas holidays. It's also very flexible, right? So you can ramp it up and down as I've alluded to from a couple of watts up to 3.4 kilowatts down and up. It's very quick. Um, and really, so all these um, capabilities uh, now enable us to do very revolutionary things in that we can now produce value from electricity for the first time anywhere in the world without needing um, physical infrastructure such as grids or pipelines or roads for trucks, um, which is revolutionary, right? Now think of all the, think of all the um, projects that could be developed on the African continent with hydro, for example, that are not feasible because there's no offtake for it, right? Bitcoin miners can go there, consume the electricity, um, and then you can slowly, with revenue being consistent from week one, build out the infrastructure necessary and offload the power bit by bit to residential customers who pay a lot more than the Bitcoin miner can afford, right? So I'll give you an example. DRC, Virunga National Park, there's a company, French company there, that has identified a 15 megawatt hydro dam that was built by the European Union or with funds from them and has now no longer any use because there's barely any electricity consumption after COVID and tourism has completely disappeared from that area, right? So there's a lot of water running down a hill and the turbines are standing still uh, virtually because there's again nowhere to offload the power to so that results in very cheap abundant uh, green energy that these guys are now using to support the park make money and it's a win-win situation right you would also need i presume to have some internet connection but i believe it's not necessary that you have the fastest internet connection that's right. So, as I said, low bandwidth uh, requirements, you can do it via satellite, Starlink, even a low 3G internet connection works. There's a company called Gridless in Kenya that knows all about that. You know, they're using um, 3G antennas and Starlinks as backups to, to connect their Bitcoin miners in the middle of nowhere in Kenya um, to the Bitcoin blockchain and to their pool. Now, your company is hash rate up. Uh, we're going to get to the definition of hash rate in a minute, but I just want to find out from you, where are you finding most of the interest coming from for Bitcoin mining? Is it farmers who've got surplus power? Is it commercial businesses who've got solar panels uh, with spare capacity on the roof? Or is it individual households? Um, so it's theoretically, or if you want a clear answer, it's businesses that understand Bitcoin mining uh, and have cheap power and want my services or are working together with me to find clients, to find money and investors, right? Um, there's a lot of private consumers who tell me these, these incredible stories. I just recently had a conversation at the Adopting Bitcoin conference here in Cape Town, where we had last weekend um, on the 27th of January. Um, that they that they had an old um, meter installed and a solar power plant on their farm, right? And so now whenever they were um, feeding electricity back to the grid, you know, their meter would turn backwards. But now the municipality would install a new meter that would now actually charge them because the meter only goes forward, charge them for any electricity that they have surplus of, right? So they, they're actually being penalized by ESCOM to have solar power installed and overcapacity going into the grid, which makes absolutely no sense. So these guys are now exploring Bitcoin mining um, for the same exact reason that we've talked about. There's a bunch of interest from from industrial users, you know, because they 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 have a um, very high financial incentives um, to do something about their their power, um, and they understand very quickly too that if your opportunity cost for this power is zero, right, meaning it's it's abundant, it's it's stranded anyway, you've got no other use for it. That the energy is essentially free, and that in your financial modeling will enable a lot of projects to be financially viable. 
That's quite fascinating. So you've got these farmers who are maybe looking at going off grid, in other words, disconnecting their solar panels from the grid because they won't get penalized and then convert that to Bitcoin mining at the times when they have surplus power. So this is exactly what I'm talking about, right? You, If you want to be independent from ESCOM and have your own power uh, supply and generation, then you will have to design your generation capacity around the fact that also in South Africa, you will have winters and times with lower sun irradiation levels, right? So that means you now need to overscale um, or overbuild your solar power plant, which will, again, result in a lot of power um, in times of the year when the sun is shining, like right now, right? Um, and there are more and more people doing that. And the doing the last mile, right? So the last 5% of keeping yourself online is the most expensive. Again, because for that 5%, for most of the year, there is no use, right? Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. You tell yep. me. Yeah, that does make sense. All right, I want to just go on to this concept of hash rate for people who are not familiar with Bitcoin. This is something, hash rate is something that is built into the Bitcoin protocol, and it's designed in such a way that it gets easier and more difficult to mine. And when we talk about mining, we're talking about solving algorithmic mathematical puzzles using computers. So this hash rate goes up and down depending on how many people are mining. Am I right in that? If you allow me to correct, um, uh, let, let's go from what a hash is, right? So on a very, very high level, on a very basic level, a hash in the Bitcoin term is not is simply a guess, right? So you're not actually solving complex mathematical algorithms. What you're actually doing is you're rolling a dice, right? You, you are guessing to find the valid answer to a block. Um, and that's what, what hashing is. So all these machines are doing is basically taking electricity as an input and having hashes, a digital value, and heat as an output. Now, these machines guess numbers trillions of times a second, which is highly energy intensive. And again, that's what these ASICs, these Bitcoin miners, are uh, especially built for. Um, and so that's, that's what a hash is. Now, the, ha the term hash rate just means how much hashes are being produced in the network at any given point. So the value would be hash rate per second or petahash if you're talking in thousands. And right now, the, the Bitcoin network has around 550 or 530 exahashes um, of, of hash value, which means it's grown quite a bit, right? So every second, there's trillions and trillions and trillions of guesses to compete for the right answer to find a block. When hash rate goes up, it means more people are doing it. And there is a target value in Bitcoin mining, which is 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, we want to find a new block, independent of how much hash power, how much hash rate, how much computing power is online, right? So every two weeks, all participants that run a so-called node in the network um, will independently check how long it took on average to find a new block. Now, if we were too quick, Right, say the number drops below 10. On average, we found blocks too quickly. That means it's too easy to find new blocks. On the other hand, if it took too long, like for instance, after the China mining ban that we've had quite a significant event, a bunch of hash rate went, went offline around half. And the block time of the Bitcoin blockchain went to, I think, around 12 minutes, which means it took way too long. Right, so then every two weeks, these nodes will check, okay, what's the average time? And they will adjust the difficulty level um, to get back into the, into, the, into the scope of the 10 minute block time that is our target value, right? So what happens if hash rate goes up? It means you know, there's more people doing it, which means it needs to become more and more difficult for Bitcoin miners to find the correct solution. Um, and that means the difficulty will be adjusted upwards. So people who you know, were listening to this a bit earlier, where you were saying that you could get one of these ASIC miners for maybe $50, one of the older versions, they'd be wondering, well, how am I going to compete with the, the newer, fancier stuff, which is maybe doing three or four times the speed of my machine? How do I compete with that? Do they still make money on it? Yeah. So the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is everybody plays by the same rules, but at different scales. 
right? There's economies of scale in Bitcoin mining and, and there the question is valid. However, again, if your power at home is free, then, you know, it doesn't get much cheaper than that. Down the line, maybe in, in 10, 20 years, we'll need to make sure to be paid more than the next guy to in order to, to do mine Bitcoin. But maybe that's another episode. Um, but essentially, you know, th that question is valid, but can be answered quite simply with you playing by the same rules. Um, and on the per kilowatt hour basis, you have the same chances to make uh, money as these as these big mining farms do. And again, right, if you are using your ASIC to use power that's essentially free, um, then you you are in a very good spot. Now, I will say, you know, use an old M20 machine, an M30 machine, uh, an old uh, S9 miner to start. Those go for very cheap, right? Um, those are Bitmain and, and MicroBT models. Now, um, to make it even more interesting, if you can manage to use the heat somehow, then you're essentially being paid extra. Right. So now not even not just your energy is free, but also you have an extra use for the heat that you otherwise would have produced from electricity. So there's an added value. Right. So at home, what South Africans like to do is produce built on. Right. So take a wooden box that you produce built on and everybody likes to uh, everybody that has done it before knows that um, that added dry air is, is a is a bonus. Um, and so what you could do is use your excess electricity and then funnel the heat into a box and dry biltong and produce that. Or, you know, in winter, what I do, I like to preheat my office. So I throw on my, my old S9 mining machine here at home instead of using my, my electric heater. Um, you know, there's a bunch of noise that comes with it. But hey, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's warm. Uh, basically, it's free Bitcoin. <laughs> Jesse Pilka who is the founder of Hashrate. Uh, thanks very much for that fascinating discussion on using your stranded solar power for Bitcoin mining. Thanks for listening to the MoneyWeb Crypto Podcast, hosted by Kieran Ryan. To listen to our other podcasts, go to moneyweb.co.za or the MoneyWeb app and follow MoneyWeb News for daily updates.